Hi everyone, thank you for joining the talk. My name is Konstantin Tarano, and today we'll be talking to you about SRDME, which is our security extension to remote direct memory access, which enables end-to-end -end authentication and encryption. SRDMA is a result of joint work of Scalable Parallel Computing Club and Network Security Group. RDMA is a mechanism which allows one machine to access memory of another machine through the network. All these memory accesses are floated to the network controllers, which enables high bandwidth and low latency communication. RDMA is widely used for HPC and machine learning workloads. RDMA is publicly available right now at Microsoft Azure Cloud and Oracle Clouds. And each year we have more and more systems which make use of RDMA to speed up their performance. However, such performance advantage comes at the cost, which actually is paid by security. Even in December 2005, it was pointed out in RFC 4297 that RDMA has to support IPsec and TLS. However, in March 2017, when somebody asked this question on the Mellanox Security Forum, it was replied by a Mellanox expert that InfiniBand architecture doesn't yet support security and it's a challenging problem. And right now, in July 2020, IPsec doesn't still support RDMA traffic. One can ask whether we can use actually application level security in this case. Since RDMA completely offloads packet processing to the network control controllers, CPU is not even involved in packet processing. And if we use two-sided communication, then packets are also processed by the network controllers. As a result, the message has to be fully received in order to be processed, and the CPU would spend its cycles on verifying such messages. That's why we propose SRDMA, which is our lightweight security extension to RDMA, which uses symmetric key cryptography to provide header authentication, packet authentication, payload encryption, and memory protection. SRDMA effectively prevents eavesdropping, spoofing attacks, replay attacks, and man in the middle attacks. SRDMA was designed to be back compatible and it can be easily adapted by existing InfiniBand architecture. From the user perspective, we propose new secure reliably connected queue pair, which requires the user to install symmetry key and required level of in required level of protection. SRDMA supports various security protections. It can be used to enable header authentication and packet authentication using hash-based message, authentic message authentication code such as SHA or cipher-based message authentication code such as CAS or Poly1305. In addition, SRDMA supports authenticated encryption, which provides secrecy to the communication. Right now, I'd like to talk about SRDMA packet format. Classical RDMA packet consists of routing header, transport header, payload, and checksums. IPsec usually encapsulates the packets, and it's even discussed right now that IPsec would encapsulate the RDMA, which means the devices would need to be able to process IPsec packets in order, in order to process RDMA packets. That's why we think that security has to be a part of the protocol, and the, its security header has to be located after the transfer header. As a result, this doesn't change any algorithms how the packets are processed in terms of routing and calculation on the checksums, and already the devices can process, and already existing devices can process such packets. The small change we propose to the existing transport header is to use three out of seven reserve bits to indicate the presence of the secure header. Depending on the value encoded in these three bits, we encode the size of the secure header. The secure header only contains message authentication code. And if this three bits has value zero, it means there is no secure header present, which enables back compatibility with existing RDMA architecture. The message authentication code varies from 96 bit to 512 bits. Another change which would require from the hardware is related to the packet sequence number. To provide protection against replay attacks, the protocol has to ensure uniqueness of the message authentication code by 
including unique value in computation of the message authentication codes. IPC currently use just packets, sequence counter for that. That's why we decided also to reuse existing packet sequence number from Finiband architecture. However, this packet sequence number are just 24 bits. And if we take existing network controllers, which can eject 200 million packets per second, these 24 bit counters get reused after 80 milliseconds, which means to provide secure communication, application was required to reestablish connection each 80 milliseconds. That's why we propose to extend this counters to 64 bits, but we would extend only the counters on endpoints. We would still transmit 24 least significant bits in the packets. Since the packet sequence number I ordered and get incremented by one for each packet, using just 24 least significant bits, we can derive the full 64 bit counter, 64 bit value used in the computation of the message authentication. Depending on the security code installed in the connection, SRDMA uses different algorithms for computation of the message authentication code. In case of authenticated encryption, the payload will be also encrypted. Right now, I'd like to talk about the overheads of SRDMA compared to the IPC, which is, does not exist yet, but it would have the following overheads. Of course, in case of AS128, when we have N connections, the both, in both, for both protocols, we would need to store the key on the device which results in 16 but multiplied by n bytes. However, since SRDMA reuses the existing counters, we would need to only add 10 bytes to the existing counters in order to provide um, protection against replay attacks. IPsec has its own counters, which would require to use 16 bytes per connection on the network controllers. Finally, SRDMA stores only the message authentication code in the header, which 16 bytes for the AS128. IPsec header is much larger, and this 32 byte is the really lower bound value, and it doesn't even include the encapsulation overhead of the IPsec. Since memory is a precious resource for network controllers, we also want to decrease uh, this memory overhead. Many work reported that exhaustion of the memory on network controllers can significantly de degrade the performance. That's why we decided to use the concept of protection domain from InfiniBand architecture. InfiniBand architecture uh, propose, introduces uh, protection domains as a way of sharing resources between connections. All the connections are created inside of these protection domains, and it means these ca connections can share memory resources. We propose instead of installing symmetric key per connection, install one symmetric key in the protection domain. And then all QPR level keys will be derived from this protection domain level key. For the derivation, we would we use the addresses of the, of the endpoints. And it's guaranteed the two endpoints will generate the same symmetric key for QPL pair level key. As a result, the network controller does not need to store key for each connection. It can only store the key for the protection domain and derive the keys of the pair for the queue pairs on the fly, which significantly de decreases the memory overhead. Finally, SRD may provide extended memory protection to the InfiniBand architecture. Right now, the protection of the memory is based on the notion of R keys, which are just 32 bit values, which are transmitted in the plain text on each packet. So if endpoint A wants to enable memory access to some endpoint B, it would send this R key value to the endpoint B. However, it can share this key with endpoint C or network eavesdropper can see this key in the packets and gain the access to the memory of endpoint A. That's why we propose crypto-based memory protection, whose main idea is to provide separate uh, crypto-based uh, access keys to the memory regions, which are calculated from the boundaries of the memory region if uh, the endpoint would like to access. 
to, position, to prove the position of these key endpoints have to include it in the calculation of the message authentication code. As a result, SRDMA does not require any extra message, any extra headers for enabling this extended memory protection and the existing field of message authentication code can be reused. Right now, I'd like to talk about the implementation of SRDMA. So SRDMA was prototyped on a smart NIC from Broadcom. Uh, this uh, was Stingray PS225. Uh, this smart NIC is equipped with eight core ARM8072 CPU, and it has eight gigabyte of DRAM. Uh, we chose the smart NIC because it uh, supports uh, crypto acceleration. Uh, this smart NIC has uh, two ports uh, of 25 gigabits. However, for smart NIC capability, only one port is available. Uh, also, since we implemented SRDMA on the top of normal RDMA connection, we have available only 20.6 gigabits per second. So this is our line rate, which we try to compare with. Uh, so first, we uh, check the performance of uh, crypt engine installed in the smart NIC, and we try differ different uh, uh, encryption algorithms uh, uh, used and we use them for authentication of the memory blocks. So we tried three block sizes, 64 bytes, uh, one kilobyte or two kilobytes. And we also try different number of uh, threads. So as, as you can see for the large blocks, uh, we could achieve line rate for all algorithms using all the threads. And we could actually achieve this line rate almost for all algorithms using less threads. Uh, it was a bit harder for smaller uh, blocks since the hash based algorithms they are not uh, tuned they were not designed to be applied to the uh, small blocks that's why they have really poor performance however this is you will see on the next slide that it's even it's enough to perform header authentication but uh, aes or like cipher based algorithms are better targeted for uh, small messages uh, that's why actually for key derivation we use ES algorithm uh, because it was the fastest one working with the small sizes uh, for the blocks of small small sizes. It was the fastest algorithm which could generate new key from a master. Uh, right now I'd like to talk how SRDMA was actually implemented. So let's imagine the case when we have two endpoints. We have endpoint A and endpoint B. Each endpoint is represented by its host application and uh, its smart NIC. And to send the message uh, between two hosts, so host A wants to send the message host B, we need to establish overall three connection. First, host has to establish connection with their smart NIC. This connection represents DMA connection. And uh, then we establish a connection between smart NICs. Uh, right now, I'd like to show how a secure RDMA write can be performed on our platform. So host A would like to send a message, write the message to the member of the host B. First, it would send it to the its smart NIC. Smart NIC, depending on the security level installed, it would uh, calculate the uh, message authentication code and append it uh, to the message. And then it will send it uh, to the smart NIC of the endpoint B. Uh, the smart NIC would receive it and it would validate this uh, message of authentication code. And if validation was successful, the smart NIC will write uh, this payload to the memory of the host B. So as you can imagine, uh, the, the latency would uh, go up compared to the uh, normal case since we have three uh, communications to deliver a packet. Uh, that's why, uh, so our baseline latency was uh, 9.5 microseconds for half round trip and the full round trip it was uh, about 18.5 uh, microseconds. Uh, so here I'd like to show you the latency for the source authentication. So for write and read latency, for write we show the results for half round trip and for read we show the results for full round trip. Uh, so in the basic case, so the basic case is when we just uh, the NIC has a key to just uh, add the MAC and send it to the other side. We could see that for AAS, this latency was less than microseconds. And uh, uh, what is important that this one microseconds is 
comprises of two parts. First part is when we calculate the message authentication code on the sender and when we verify this message authentication code on the receiver. So overall, it's 0 0.25. Three uh, microseconds on each side uh, to work with the header authentication. Uh, of course, uh, hash based algorithms such SHA, uh, they had higher latency because, as I mentioned earlier, they were not designed to work with small sizes and the, the header of the message is quite small. Uh, right now, I'd like to show results for the PT protection, extended protection case. So as you remember, the PD protection, extended memory protection requires key derivation. And this latency is actually worst case scenario. That's uh, when the NIC doesn't have a key to immediately to calculate the message authentication code. So it has to first derive it. But in the real case, uh, the smart NIC would cache it and we would expect the, uh, the performance as for basic case. But here, this is the latency, what if we sender wants to send it and its smart NIC doesn't have a key in cache and has to first derive it uh, to protect the packet and the receiver as well. It cannot immediately start uh, verifying the packet. It first needs to derive the key and then it starts ver verification. So in that case, the latency goes up even higher. So it, each process of derivation adds about one microsecond uh, on each side. And of course, when we had the experiment, when we had uh, both enabled, so we need to derive keys twice, uh, the latency even uh, went up. But I'd like to um, point out again that this is the worst case scenario. This is what if the key is not in cache. So we performed a similar experiment, but here we measured the full packet protection. So here we is uh, calculated the message of indication code over the whole packet. And uh, on the top four lines is read latency. So this is a full round trip. And for write latency, it's half round trip. Uh, since the packet of indication depends on the payload size, we measure this for different payload sizes, uh, starting from 32 bytes up to two kilobytes. And again, we measured and the different, uh, with different features uh, enabled in sRDMA. And these numbers, again, for PD protection, extended memory protection are the worst case scenario. So the key is not cached. And if it would, would they would be cached, uh, we ex expect that we would have mostly uh, hits because you never send just one packet. Starting from the second packet, the key will be uh, in cache. You would have the same performance as for uh, basic uh, write and reads. So as we can see, the like the best algorithm here was uh, uh, poly 1305. So it had the, the lowest latency for full packet authentication. And the AS uh, was had a bit uh, higher latency. However, when we performed the experiment with uh, authentication encryption, so in this case, we authenticate the message and we also replace the payload. It turned out that EAS uh, had better performance. And we, we will see the, this difference even more when we uh, run bandwidth experiments, which was a bit surprising for us. So here we can conclude that for full message authentication, we think that the best algorithm would be poly 1305. And of course, SHA uh, 256 uh, had also good performance because it was applied uh, to the large uh, message. Uh, but for authenticated encryption, we think that AES is, uh, has uh, the best uh, performance. Uh, right now, I'd like to talk about the right bandwidth. So first of all, I'd like to explain the, this uh, baseline we had. So we took our infrastructure, as you remember, we had this free Cooper connections between host A and host B to send. So we measured how much bandwidth we can achieve with this uh, code base uh, without using any authentication and encryption. We just actually just send the packets from host A, host B, and we do not verify the packets. And it turned out if we use just one thread of our smart NIC, we could achieve only about eight gigabits per second 
and uh, we couldn't achieve the full line rate. However, when we use four threads, we could achieve the full uh, line rate. So this black line is represents the bandwidth we could achieve without enabling any uh, protection on the packets. So in the basic uh, case protection, so the basic case is like when we have keys on the NIC and we can immediately protect the packets. For header authentication, we could achieve line rate using uh, six threads for all uh, protection codes. For full packet authentication, we could also do this uh, for all uh, cipher-based algorithms and uh, only SHA-512 could not achieve it. And actually, AS-128 had hard time achieving the line rate for eight threads. However, when we switch to the authenticated encryption mode, AS uh, beats Poly-1305 uh, algorithm. So which concludes our previous uh, conclusion uh, that AS-128 is better for uh, authenticated encryption. Poly-1305 mm -hmm. is better for packet authentication. Uh, then we measured uh, the bandwidth uh, for the writes uh, when we have enabled PT protection, extended memory protection. Again, here we try to express the case, like really worst case scenarios. We have really small cache or somehow each time we send the message, the, the key is not on the, on the NIC and we need to derive it each time. So we, each time we send the message, we have a miss on the sender and the receiver. Uh, so in this case, we had decreased by two gigabits uh, per second uh, for the all cases, but we still were able to achieve the line rate for head, header authentication and also for some algorithms for uh, packet authentication. And finally, when we enable both and we had constant misses, uh, the performance got decreased by another two gigabits, but for header authentication, we could still achieve the line rate. We performed similar experiment for the read bandwidth. Uh, for read bandwidth, uh, the, our baseline was even lower. So for no protection installed, we could achieve only five gigabits per second. So it's uh, even slower for the write case. Uh, the main reason for that, that read requests are uh, more complicated than, uh, than write. So in case of read, uh, the, the device needs special capabilities and even in, existing InfiniBand, you need to install the contacts on the initiator and on the target. Uh, so it's like special slots on the device where it stores the contacts for performing the operation. And we had to actually emulate uh, this in the software of our SmartNIC. So that's why uh, the maximum um, performance we could achieve was about 16 gigabits. And uh, for one thread, it was only five gigabits. Uh, anyway, so we measured the header authentication, packet authentication, and the authentication encryption for this algorithm. And uh, for header authentication, we could achieve line rate for all algorithms. For packet authentication, we couldn't do that, but we had the, the algorithms which were really close achieving the line rate. So uh, again, the best one uh, here was Poly1305. And uh, in the case of authenticated encryption, the best one was again AS128. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, so for read requests, uh, we have to perform protection, uh, the process of uh, protecting validating packet four times. So in the right case, we have the sender which uh, protects the packet and the receiver who validates. So read uh, request consists of the full round trip. So we have a, uh, read request, which which is uh, protected, then that get validated by the destination. Then destination sends the result. It protects it, sends it to the to the initiator. And the initiator checks uh, the validates the uh, the packets it received. So that's why it's more complicated. So again, we tried with enable PD protection, extended memory protection. That's uh, the case when the keys are not cached. So that's worst case scenario. Uh, we had similar results as uh, for writes, and uh, also quite similar results when we had both enabled. As we could see, actually, we could still, even with enabled all this feature, we could still achieve really high uh, bandwidth using just general purpose CPU. This is like 
not really powerful ARM CPUs, and uh, we expect better results if this algorithm would be implemented in the FPGAs, for example. Uh, right, now, right now, I'd like to invite you to read the full paper. So the things I didn't uh, explain that our SRDMA also supports uh, memory subdelegation based on our, uh, on our extended crypto-based memory protection, which allows to give access to the memory of other parties in the network. Uh, in addition, we have more, detail, more details on the implementation of SRDMA and extra experiments. For example, we integrated SRDMA in the Herd Key Value Store, and you could see the results of our experiments in the paper. Uh, here I'd like to conclude my talk. So I'd like to remind that SRDMA is lightweight security extension to RDMA. So it was designed to have as little as possible changes to the current protocol. So it and uh, it has to be back compatible. Uh, in addition, we uh, take into account the memory constraints of the network controllers and try to reduce it as much as possible. And we think we achieved it. Uh, in our imp implementation and our evaluations, we were limited by the platform we were using for prototyping, but we truly believe that SRTMA can be easily adapted to the hardware to achieve even higher bandwidth and lower latency communication. So if you have any questions, please uh, contact me through the email you can see on the screen. Thank you.